Let's go to our preaching time this morning. I want you to turn to two places, please, in the Old Testament. Psalm 9 and Isaiah chapter 30. Psalm 9 and Isaiah chapter 30. As we get underway, I'll give you a moment to find those two places. Psalm 9 and Isaiah chapter 30. Let's read those texts. First of all, Psalm 9, verse 8 says, And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Now go forward to Isaiah 30 and verse 18. Isaiah 30, verse 18. And therefore will the Lord wait, that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Isaiah 30, verse 18 here says, The Lord is a God of judgment. The Apostle Paul said, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he shall judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, that man being Christ, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Acts 17, verse 31. Your judgment is confirmed by the fact that the one who's going to judge you is still alive. He came back to life from the dead. You haven't seen the last or heard the last of Jesus Christ yet. If God is as sinless and undefiled as we assume him to be, then he has every right to judge the world. If he made it, it's certainly his to control and certainly his to judge. Um, and he has the right to judge their hearts, not just the heart alone. I mean, did they love God or were they enemies of God? But their, their actions, their words, their gestures, their behavior, their motives. Why did they do the things they did? He has a right to judge those things as well. The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 9, verse 17. The Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14, verse 34. Christ said, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them, the one from the other, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Matthew 25, verses 31 and 32. I don't have all the answers, but... If I can today, let me examine the ways God plans to judge nations one day. Every nation on earth is being watched by the Lord. And they're going to be evaluated by the Lord for future judgment. I want you to turn to a, a key verse on this subject. That is in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, notice two verses there, verses 26 and 27. Speaking of God, it says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. There's a number of things true in that verse. There is a medically or scientific truth uh, in that verse, hath made of one blood. Certain blood types can be transfused from person to person, to, no matter what race they may be of. And uh, that's 
a, a basic truth. The JWs don't believe in blood transfusion because they think it's classified as cannibalism, eating flesh. Um, of course, it's not. But uh, so they've had children die because their parents were re refused blood transfusions uh, and went against the medical doctor's advice. But God has led the nations and the races of the world into the territories they were intended to occupy. And each one must find God. And Paul says he's not far from every one of us. Do you know something? One of the easiest propositions or one of the easiest things in the world is to get saved. It's one of the simplest things anyone can ever do. You admit you're a sinner and understand that Christ died for the sake of sinners. He was punished on your behalf. God will grant you forgiveness and righteousness of Christ we put upon you. It's a very simple transaction. It's a very simple proposition. In fact, it's so simple, most people in the world miss it. That's a very unfortunate fact. But uh, God can, uh, the Bible says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Psalm 24, verse 1. God can divide the nations and the races of men according to his own will. And the length, the duration of some nations' existence is based on certain criteria found in the Word of God. And these will be universal. I want to give you a list of a, a handful of them today. And so I call this sermon, All Nations Under God. All Nations Under God. God will evaluate nations according to, number one, their history of righteousness. I mean, their total amount of good versus their total amount of bad. And uh, living here in what I think has been the most blessed and prosperous nation in the history of the earth, you have to start scratching your head as to how much good versus how much bad the United States is responsible for. How does God evaluate this nation? But God told Abraham that his descendants would inherit the land of the Canaanites eventually. But they would have to wait 400 years first, he said, quote, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Genesis 15, verse 16. He was going to give those nations living in Canaan 400 years more time to clean up their act before he would send Israel in to conquer them and subdue them. Similarly, God was ready to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because, quote, their sin is very grievous, Genesis 18, verse 20. But God said he would spare those cities if he could find even 10 righteous within those cities there in Genesis 18, verse 32. You recall Abraham's seeking to bargain with God because he knew Lot, his worthless nephew, was living in Sodom and was hanging around with all the fags uh, and not trying to witness to any of them, wasn't passing out gospel tracts uh, down in the you know, down to the French Quarter or wherever they were at, and uh, knew that he probably hadn't uh, influenced anybody's soul for God. But maybe, just maybe, 10 people were believing in God because of Lot. God said, if I find even 10 righteous there, I won't destroy it. But how were the righteous standards of God known to men before God gave commandments and laws to Moses in the book of Exodus. How were these things known to the ancient world? The answer, of course, is given to us also in the Word of God. Turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. This question may come up to you sometime in conversation with somebody. How did people know what was right and wrong? How did God judge people before Moses came along, huh? before the Ten Commandments? How did God judge people? How does God judge people who've never heard of the Bible, who have never heard a minister, they've never heard a sermon preached, they've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. How does God plan to judge them? Not everybody knows about Jesus Christ. Run them to Romans chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. It says there, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, 
do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. People have just enough conscience to tell them what's right and what's wrong. And that conscience, uh, if they uh, ignore it and avoid it and try to not respond to it, time and time again, the Bible says becomes uh, seared with a hot iron, according to the Apostle Paul in the book of Timothy. And so men ignore the conscience within them so much so it, do, it no longer has any uh, effect. The conscience can tell you when something's right or when something's wrong, but it's not strong enough to keep you from doing the wrong. It'll tell you when you have done wrong and you know it. And uh, he says, the meanwhile, uh, accusing or else excusing one another. You'll find some reason to justify your doing it, but condemn somebody else for doing it, no matter what it is. And so God will judge men according to the knowledge they do have or did have based on their conscience. You knew something was wrong. You know, every civilization, every society knows it's wrong to lie. They know it's wrong to take something that doesn't belong to them, that's theft, stealing. They know it's not right to take someone else's husband, someone else's wife. They know it's uh, wrong to disrespect and show uh, uh, bitterness, hatred, disobey their parents. They know these things instinctively. But one day they'll have the perfect law of God laid out before them, and it will have simply confirmed everything they already knew. And they'll realize they violated the, the knowledge they did have anyway. They knew certain things were wrong, but they went ahead and did it anyway. And then they'll stand before the perfect judge of the universe and they'll have no excuse. They'll, they'll have to admit they're, they're guilty before God. God's not unfair. God's not unjust. He'll judge them based upon the knowledge that they do have. They did have access to. In the Old Testament, someone who was known for doing more good than bad was referred to as a righteous man, a good man, a just man. And someone who was known for doing more bad than good was often called a fool, a wicked man, a corrupt man, an evil man, an unrighteous man, an unjust man. You'll find all those terms spread out in the book of Psalms and Proverbs to identify one from the other. And that's how man tends to think now that oh, if my good works outweigh my bad works, I'll get to heaven. Uh, or if my bad works outweigh my good works, I won't make it to heaven. Somehow the scales always tip in their favor, no matter who you're talking to, no matter what the circumstance. The scales are always going to tip in their favor, but uh, not so much for the next guy. That guy, yeah, I don't know about him. And they think that it's the total amount of good versus the total amount of bad that will determine where they spend eternity. That's not it at all. But have you trusted the one who is absolutely sinless and without flaw, without any imperfection at all? If so, his righteousness is granted to you and you get in under his name. But if you haven't, you can believe anything. There are really only two religions in the world. There's the faith of Jesus Christ and there's everything else. <laughs> Two beliefs in the world. The faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything else. Because no matter what the other thing is, it comes down to you doing it your way somehow. Somehow you earning it. You meriting it. You getting to a place where you deserve it or you are entitled to it, you think. But God is going to judge nations based upon their overall history of righteousness. And I mean that in the Old Testament sense, good versus bad. I don't think we should de uh, deny that at all. And then verse 16 of Romans 2 says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, like I say, the absolute truth of the righteousness of God and the law of God uh, perfected by Jesus Christ will be laid out and men who 
violated the conscience they had will have nothing, will have no excuse. They'll realize that simply confirms that I'm guilty. I've been guilty all along. And when Paul says my gospel, he meant the gospel he was out preaching. It wasn't one he invented. But secondly, God is going to judge men based upon their search for God. Their search for God. Paul noted uh, this criteria concerning the times and the territories of the nations. He said there in Acts 17, 27, that they should seek the Lord. The Lord promises those that seek me early shall find me, Proverbs 8, verse 1. The Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near, Isaiah 55, and verse 6. The Bible says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him, 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. And God has given such abundant uh, uh, evidence and testimony in the creation and the created world and the universe we see that uh, you are without excuse. If you see the marvels of God's creation, if you see the operating with mathematic precision of the heavenly bodies, the stars and the planets, the sun and the moon, and so on, and say there was no intelligence behind it, it all happened somehow by accident. You are without excuse. Uh, the Bible says, Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Acts 14, verse 17. The natural processes of seed and growth and vegetation and the production of food, just enough to feed virtually all life on the earth is a miracle. It really is. The only places where people uh, are starving in mass, uh, many are, are normally countries that are withholding food from their people to keep them subject, to keep them uh, in some sort of servitude to the government. How many people were starved to death in North Korea back in the 70s? Hundreds of thousands died in mass starvation because of the government withholding food from people and giving it to people who were loyal to the state. And that goes on in African Muslim-run countries. That goes on all over the world. But all of that, the natural creation we see around us, all of that should be a testimony to the God of the Bible, who the Bible says uh, made it all and controls it all. And the sad fact is that many ancient nations, the Bible says, when they knew God, glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. And the Bible also says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Romans 1, verses 21 and 28. The things they could know about God, they still rejected. Well, if you don't retain God in your knowledge, after you know you should, after you have every reason to believe in God and you, you still dismiss it, what have you done? You've forgotten God. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Some countries have been blessed beyond measure and yet they've forgotten God. They haven't even sought, sought out the true Lord God who provided those blessings. And right now, even as I speak, I'm thinking of the nation of Japan, one of the most prosperous, modernized nations in the history of the world. By and large, they don't seek after God. You know what? They're about to destroy themselves by not having enough children. They have negative birth rate. More people are dying in Japan than are being born to replace them. And uh, Mark Stein wrote a book a few years ago called America Alone. But he pointed out in that book that with the rise of Islam and the spread of Islam all around the world, uh, a nation such as Japan, with all of its skyscrapers and industries and factories 
and technology and all the modern things that they enjoy is going to be ripe for some other nation to take it over because there aren't enough Japanese people to continue running it. They talked about some doctors who just are like circuit riding doctors. They visit certain islands uh, on a schedule to treat women who are expecting children and so forth. And many times, if the woman goes into labor, she has the child without any doctor in her life because it's not the day for him to visit. That's how remote uh, many people are and how few doctors they have to visit, or I should say OBGYNs, to help take care of women who are expecting children. There aren't enough people being born to replace the population that's there, that's currently dying. And as a general truth, the kingdom of the nation of Japan has not been a nation seeking after Jesus Christ. That's the difference between the blessings uh, that came upon Japan after they surrendered uh, at the end of World War II and the blessings that came upon South Korea. South Korea welcomed the gospel. South Korea welcomed the preaching. Of Jesus Christ. And... Uh, just like any country that allows the preaching of Jesus Christ, you get a lot of screwballs and nuts that go in there and preach heresy, start churches in the name of Jesus, and they're nothing but, you know, personality cults. But we got plenty of those here in the U.S. We got anywhere you go where you find the gospel preached, you're going to find a false gospel preached. So that's, that's another problem beside the point. But a country like Japan that didn't really allow it much at all, hang on to... Buddhism, hang on to Shinto, Shinto religion and other beliefs, ancestral worship. It's a matter of, it was a matter of time before their own philosophies caught up with them and now they're destroying themselves just by uh, lack of birth rate. But, and so God uses a lot of things to let nations be judged, to judge nations. Do they really seek after God or do they not seek after God? I mean, the truth was there. You know, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, the Mormons had about 2,000 missionaries ready to go, ready to send the former Soviet Union states. And it took true believers a while to catch up. But while there was a window of opportunity, a lot of true believers, we've uh, supported missionaries in the Ukraine and in the other parts of the former Soviet Union, where the window of opportunity was there for true believers to go there. Uh, you can teach the Bible in colleges and universities in Russia. You can't teach it, you can't even read it here in America, but uh, there are some places in the former Soviet Union states that will allow the Bible to be taught and read and preached in universities. Those cities or those states are going to prosper. The ones who don't allow it are going to diminish and fall apart. But besides those two criteria, their overall righteousness and their seeking after God, God uses this to evaluate nations. He uses their blessing of Israel. Their blessing of Israel. God told Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. God had promised to send a Savior into the world, and he prepared a nation of people through whom that Savior would come and bless the rest of the world by extension. Uh, and although the nation of Israel has often failed God, you read about their doubt of God and their failure of God and their provoking of God and their testing of God and their complaining against God, God made promises to grant Abraham's descendants a certain piece of land and the rest of the world by association eventually. And those people are still here because God plans to fulfill those promises, to keep those promises. <laughs> God even allowed ungodly nations to come in and conquer Israel. Think of the, the uh, Philistines time and time again, the Babylon and, and Syria armies and so on, 
to chastise Israel for their rebellion, and then God would chastise those nations for their mistreatment of Israel. God knows what he's doing. But right now, the United States seems to be enjoying uh, increased economic prosperity. We weren't, we weren't looking for it. We, or rather, we weren't looking um, towards it. We weren't expecting it four or five years ago. But over the last three years, there's been an incredible uptick in financial prosperity. Uh, those who follow the stock market and the NASDAQ, it's way up over 20,000 points. And it keeps setting records, growing higher and higher for those who invest uh, on Wall Street. There's record employment, record unemployment, especially under, for, for uh, black Americans and Hispanic Americans. The unemployment levels are at their lowest in 50 years since they've been tracking these things. And some factories that moved out of the country have, be, have decided to move back because they were given better tax incentives to do so. There was an, a tax reduction nationwide. Now, each person might not be getting rich, but there should be a little bit more in their paycheck than there was two or three years ago. You can't say that the blessings our country is enjoying right now aren't somehow tied to the fact that President Trump recognized Jerusalem as the rightful capital of Israel, even though the Muslims didn't like it, even though the Catholic Pope didn't like it, but he's never been right about anything anyway. And uh, even though most of the United Nations members condemned it, we did it anyway. I'm glad we did. Man, I'm glad we did. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And uh, all we have to do is defend their right to exist, to say they're being unjustly targeted. Fox News reported that in 2018, the UN General Assembly or the UN Security Council passed 21 resolutions condemning Israel for one thing or another in their conflict with the Syrians and their conflict with the uh, Arab and Palestinian peoples. And only six resolutions condemning violence among all the other nations around the world. On the same year. And Fox News reported that the bias of the United Nations against Israel is undeniable. It's unmistakable and undeniable. And let me go so far as to say this. If there are 192, 194 member nations in the United Nations... Which two countries are the most modernized and most developed? Israel and the United States. And the day the United States turns its back and begins to vote against Israel, this nation will go down. Think of the overall living standards and conditions of most of those other countries who vote against Israel. Are they better or worse than the standard of living you and I enjoy? Dennis Prager said when he visits Israel, he's always amazed. He can get up on the top of a hill, look off in the distance, and see where green, the green ends in the horizon. That's where the state of Israel ends. That's the border. And the nations beyond that border are still uh, arid and dry and wastelands. The Bible says jealousy is the rage of a man, the book of Psalms. And uh, the Arab nations around them, you'd think they'd learn, we ought to green up our states as well. Let's import more trees and plants. And this reciprocal um, effect of attracting more rainfall will keep it watered. Our nation will become as prosperous as Israel. But they won't do it because that would be admitting that the Jew was smarter than we were. And so jealous, they're jealous. And uh, so they want to take it over. They, want, they don't want... I tell you what, if Israel were to do, of course, they're not going to do it, and God's not going to let it happen. But if someone says, I want that land, you took it from me, you took it from our ancestors, say, fine, we'll give it back to you. 
but we'll return it to the same condition we found it. So they don't want they don't want it returned to them in the condition it was once before. Once before they want it handed over to them in the condition it's now been it's become. But the nation that blesses Israel and defends Israel's right to exist is going to receive the blessing of God. If some impoverished third world country wants to dig itself out of its um, dire circumstances, my first recommendation would be to find some way to bless the state of Israel. Vote in favor of its survival if you're in the United Nations. And vote against anyone who would try to call for its destruction. Um, not only, and I said I was going to make one more point. CNN and some of the liberal leaning news media outlets, they've had contributors who speak at Muslim and Arabic conferences who also support the destruction of the state of Israel. So even among networks, the ones who condemn Israel are lagging far behind in the ratings as opposed to the one who is a friend of Israel. I think Sean Hannity's program has more viewers than CNN and MSNBC and ABC News combined, night after night. Fourthly, let me say this. God uses this as a criteria for nations and how they have responded to the gospel. At the present time, the New Testament church, God has raised up another generation called and holy nation, a peculiar people, to show uh, which, and he says, uh, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. First Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. And let me move along for time's sake here. In this nation, there is no king except Jesus Christ. In that particular nation, he, they are members who have been redeemed by his blood shed on the cross of Calvary. The Bible says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Ephesians 2, verse 19. In this nation is the New Testament church, the body of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. And the citizens of this kingdom have their citizenship in heaven, and yet you, you and I are said to be ambassadors for Christ here on the earth. And our job is to persuade men to be reconciled to God, for 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. And the Lord Jesus sent his apostles out to teach all nations, Matthew 28, 19. And uh, the response to their preaching, their teaching, uh, is part of the criteria God will use to evaluate and judge those nations in the future. Christ told the disciples if the citizens uh, they preached to rejected them, quote, when ye depart out of that house or that city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city, Matthew 10, verses 14 and 15. Paul and Barnabas did just that when they were driven out of the city of Antioch in Acts 13, verse 51. Uh, any nation that persecutes either Israel or persecutes the church uh, and rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ, is going to live one day to regret it. Let me move on for time's sake. Lastly, let me add this. One of the criteria God will use to evaluate and judge nations is their stewardship of the earth. Their stewardship of the earth. God told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth, Genesis 1, verse 28. He said to have dominion over all the earth, verse 26. James writes, 4,000 years later, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, James 3, verse 7. And of course, the next verse tells us man's biggest problem is he can't tame his mouth. He can't tame his tongue. He doesn't know when to shut his mouth. And how many have you ever gotten yourself in trouble, regretted? You, you open your mouth, said something you shouldn't have. And you, of course, it's too late to apologize then. You know, and they, your apology falls flat. They don't believe you. 
That's been my problem on occasion. I suppose everyone else too. But God's mandate was for man to have dominion over the earth and subdue it. Let me bring this to a close for today. According to archaeologists, there were estimated 70 original nations testified to not long after the division at the Tower of Babel. And these have now grown to over 200 organized countries in the world, representing 7,000 languages, distinct languages and dialects in the world now. And many nations have perished, the Phoenicians and the Sumerians, they, don't long, they no longer exist. Most of the nations still existing today will still be here when Jesus Christ comes back. And they will be subject to his judgment, to his criteria, to his evaluation as to how they treated the Jew, how they responded to the gospel when it was preached, how they respond to the gospel which will be preached during the tribulation. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, it's not the gospel of the grace of God any longer. But how they responded and how they treated the Jew in his worst time of persecution. And uh, when, he enter when he begins his millennial reign, he begins to judge the nations as to how they behave themselves before that time. And the primary criteria or criterion of men will be how they responded to Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. I'm glad I have him. I'm glad I know him. I'm glad that I was saved as a little boy, and uh, I've been a sorry Christian many times, but I've never been sorry that I was one. And nor have I ever forgotten that I was one, nor have I ever doubted it. I've doubted how God could love me in spite of my failures, but I've never doubted that I belong to him. And I'm looking forward to seeing him.